the U.S. government has been considering the matter for perhaps longer than they should, and where the, the consideration is down to at this point is the U.S. government deciding whether to allow ICANN to sign the route or whether to give that job to VeriSign. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, personally, I feel like it's better for the international community to have a voice in how this happens because it's globally important. And I think that ICANN is a bottom-up organization that gives the international community that voice. Uh, VeriSign is a perfectly decent company. They've done a perfectly good job with .com and .net. However, they are a private corporation and they do things the way they see best and that is not subject to global input. So anyway, that's one very contentious political issue that is being discussed at this IGF that was not really even up for discussion yet uh, a year ago. So we're um, making progress. Yeah, we're making progress. Uh, Bernadette, I believe, was uh, next. And then you, and then you, I believe. Yes, I wanted to find out a bit more about the NSRC, um, the facilities and the programs, and also what are the requirements to make a, a group or, or individuals eligible for assistance from the NSRC? Uh, NSRC, the Network Startup Resource Center, is a project of the University of Oregon. Uh, they get funding from the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Um, uh, Cisco Systems donates a lot of uh, textbooks to them, uh, and I believe they get some money and, and books and materials from other uh, publishers as well. And they use the NSF money to send books out to organizations that are trying to do training in different countries. Uh, I, they're very much driven by requests. Uh, I don't know that they have formal criteria for who meets those or not. I, I can't speak for them. Yeah. But I don't know if Steve Huter is going to be uh, on the IGF. In any case, I can share the, the contacts of Steve, yeah. which is the head of the uh, of this organization, so you can contact him directly and, and, and ask him about if there is any, any formal procedure to, to receive requests. <coughs> but I'm happy to share that, uh, the information with you. Yes. Transiting versus peering from ISP's point of view, are we talking differences in the magnitude, you know, sort of order of magnitude? Is that dependent on how, how much traffic you carry? And what determines um, sort of membership in IXP? Is it, again, traffic or sort of might or is it government intervention that they get together ISPs within a country and put this together? So um, normally the way internet exchange points are formed is a bunch of internet service providers will come together and form it as a consortium themselves and usually in order to avoid regulation or government intervention they make these organizations open so that subsequent internet service providers who want to get started can come and join them on the same terms. Um, as always, with any private sector initiative, there's the danger of protectionism, where a bunch of parties get together and try and block new entrants. So um, thus far, this hasn't been, I would say it hasn't been a huge problem because there's no barrier to entry to forming new exchange points. So uh, there are places, like for instance in London and Amsterdam, where there are big exchange points that were formed that over time the members have grown and have said well we can afford to spend more money now so we'll have this be very expensive and then we won't have to worry quite as much about competition from smaller new entrants. Um, the smaller new entrants then promptly got together and formed their own exchange points <laughs> that had no fees uh, in, in the very same building, right? So uh, then the big guys in order to be able to deliver traffic to the little guys uh, had to start to accommodate them and start to participate at the, these cheaper exchange points as well. Um, it's a much more complex system than, than I'm summarizing it, but 
basically, because there's no difficulty in starting new exchange points, that hasn't been as big a problem as it would have been otherwise. If, for instance, a government said, we will only allow new exchange points to be started under license, that would be a horrible problem because that, put together with the ISP's desire to prevent new entrants, would give them a tool to, to preclude people from entering the market. But um, right now, there are only a couple of countries that require a license for operating an internet exchange point, and uh, basically those are all pro forma. Um, I believe India is one of those countries. This is a situation that I am not very clear on because it's very political and it's changed a lot over time here in India. Uh, Kenya is another one. Um, uh, Michuki Mwangi, who is sitting in the back of the room here, uh, built the exchange point in Nairobi. And uh, for a long time, it was the only exchange point in the world that had a license framed on the wall. And that was mostly due to a misunderstanding with the government in the very first week of its operation. And it's been pretty much pro forma since then, I think, right? Yeah, so it hasn't really been a problem. So, sorry, the other half of the question. Oh, the difference between price of uh, peering and transit. To participate in an exchange point might be free or it might be costly. And to get your traffic to get your traffic to the exchange point will have some cost. Whereas just dumping it on somebody else and letting them deal with it, they assume all those costs. Um, there are places where the, the cost difference is very, very small. Um, in most of the United States, most of Western Europe, that cost difference is very small. So in order to be able to take advantage of peering, you have to be very, very large. The multiplier, the amount of traffic you run through that connection has to be very large before it makes sense. There are other places like Tanzania or uh, Bangladesh where the cost of transit might be astronomically high and the cost of peering is really essentially free. They're just one-time costs of running your own fiber and buying the equipment and then after that you get as much as you can run through the, the connection. And in that case, you're very, very highly incented to use peering. So the more exchange points there are, the more people there are at the exchange points, the more the price of transit tends to be forced down towards the, the cost of peering. That is, people can't ex extract excess profit. But where exchange points are very scarce and um, uh, transit is international, then people extract a lot of excess profit for the transit. Um, yeah, you are next. So this is a session about uh, terminology and technology for the internet. <clears throat> so I'd like to ask what's uh, essentially a request for a discussion of a policy issue concerning terminology. And the terminology is that of the internet itself. Um, as everybody in this room probably knows, the internet itself was essentially a framework in which different networks could then federate so that both the networks and the computers attached to each of them could communicate with each other without the user having to know all the details of the interconnection and the like. And yet, um, uh, in even today's newspaper, the chairman of Nokia was quoted as saying, there isn't one internet, there are literally he picked a big number, hundreds of thousands, millions of different internets that are going to be around the world. Well, if it really is the case that every network is called an internet, then we run the risk of having the definition of internet be subverted. And I guess the policy question I'd like to ask is uh, whether we could have a, some discussion about what could be done to deflect the um, attempts by others to sort of redefine the internet to be something other than what it really is. Yeah. Um, I have a t-shirt that of course I'm not wearing because I'm at a policy meeting rather than an engineering meeting that says, uh, nature abhors a walled garden. Um, essentially what you're referring to is walled gardens. A walled garden is a network that has some putative benefits that people aren't allowed into from the outside and people from the inside of it may have difficulty getting to the outside. So there are a lot of cell phone service providers, mobile phone providers, 
who provides some access to the internet, but maybe it's not exactly the same internet you would get if you connected directly yourself. And yet they advertise this as internet service. Um, if you hooked your cell phone up to your laptop, would your laptop get the same kind of access to the internet as it would if you hooked up to a Wi-Fi hotspot, if you bought internet service from an internet service provider? So these terminology questions are really important. Um, do you guys want to? Um, now, first, I'm honored to take a question from from Bob Kahn. Fairly in convincing the the, the, the cell phone companies of the, of the world to uh, um, modify their you know anything that will affect their bottom line, but uh, um, but to be able to explain it, I still run into a number of people out there, both policymakers and and business people that. Uh, have still have a difficult time not only understanding the the, the, the transit versus peering um, kind of the arguments that Bill has made so eloquently, but but also the uh, the fundamental nature that the internet came about because of this need to communicate, this need to cooperate, and this need for connectivity. Uh, because that it, it is sometimes a hard thing to grasp, but but that is what makes this all work: is the desire for different groups to communicate in a different. Um, different walled gardens, I guess, in the case of cell phone companies that, to communicate that at some point the consumers um, of their services will, will require this and, and expect this as being part of the Internet. So uh, I know that's a bit of a vague answer, but that's, that's, that's what I feel in, in, in my heart is that, uh, that there is still um, um, a long path that we need to all take to explain to those who don't um, understand the, the cooperative value of the Internet. So that's um, from, my, from my very personal perspective, um, there has been a, a lot of discussions about uh, how the internet should be run and developed. Um, with all this process of the IGF when it started in the, uh, the World Summit of Internet Society, um, there was a, a, a comment that, um, that was uh, said many times that uh, we need to be very careful about uh, try to fix a problem that don't really exist. You know, uh, it's not about defending the status quo. It's it's it's, it's having a, a a very practical uh, perspective of the situation. Why I look in a problem where there is not a problem? Um, uh, there is plenty of problems that we are facing right now. You know? uh, the, the the access challenges that we are having in in remote regions. You know, um, how how can we bring the next billion? And, uh, how we can deal with, with the model? Uh, with the business model for operators in, on, in those regions, for example, to make a real uh, business case and, 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 and make them make money and not, and not pay for a, a, a South American ISP to pay 10,000 times for a, for a 10,000 less bandwidth than another ISP from, uh, from, from uh, East United States to, uh, to, to Western Europe. Um, I think that's the challenge that we are need to face in this kind of, uh, of meetings. Um, uh, and um, keep aside and always time and think that are not uh, are not worth it to, to deal with because there is not nothing to to, to, to fix there. I mean, this, there is a lot of work that has been done, but uh, many organizations that have allow us to have the internet that we have right now, you know. Um, and there is a lot of work to do uh, ahead, and we need to focus our efforts and tackle that problem, that we, the really problem that we have. Okay. This uh, another. Uh, hot button term that's tied up in this is network neutrality. Network neutrality is the question of whether if I build a network, should I be able to control what flows across it? Or is there a fundamental right of the users of the network to determine what traffic will go to and from them? Um, the problem here, I would say, is one of competition not one of control. That, um, and, and my my views on this, I think, are sort of in between or different than the two major camps. One major camp might be characterized by Google saying, "End users want to see Google, and they want to see the real, you know, trademarked Google, not something that claims to be Google, not something that a cell phone service provider substitutes in at the last moment." you know, not a pale imitation. They want to talk to us directly, and anyone who gets in the way of us is getting in the way of their own customers and 
you know, the freedom of the marketplace, right? So that's one perspective. The other perspective is that of a phone, phone company that says, we've invested a vast amount of money in building this infrastructure and we're losing money on it uh, and we need any way we can to make more money, to break even, and one way would be to charge customers more, to increase their fees from $10 a month to $100 a month. Another way would be to leave the customer's fee at $10 a month, but to charge Google $90 a month for the privilege of accessing them, even though the customer already accessed Google and paid us $10 for that, right? So you can see I'm not, I'm not really sympathetic with the idea that service providers, even though I, I, I have been a service provider for a very long time, I'm not sympathetic with the idea that they should be forcing anyone else to be their customer. On the other hand, service providers have a responsibility to protect their customers from different kinds of threats, right? If someone is trying to attack your customer and install malware on their computer, defending the customer, defending their machine, requires intervention in, in the network layer. It requires that you know what's happening on the network and that you be able to take action on that. And that's not a free speech issue. It's not a freedom of the press issue. It's a very real pragmatic issue of defending the users against a real threat. So what I would say is that in a marketplace in which there are many different internet service providers competing with each other, users can decide which internet service provider's behavior suits what they want best. And if one, you, if one ISP says that they're selling internet service, but users say that doesn't look like the internet to me, then the marketplace has made the decision of what is real internet. And you don't need to get governments involved in defining that term. You don't need to get certification and testing bodies involved in measuring different provider services. Um, that's much simpler. But in an environment where a government is only going to hand out five licenses to five different companies, and say, you five will be the internet service providers for this country and no one else, then you've got a bad problem, just as if governments only allow a certain number of internet exchange points. I'm very much a believer in Yeah. So that's a, actually a very good discussion of the general, the general issue. But I still want to come back to the question I asked originally, which is, if the folks who are trying to break the definition of what internet is start to succeed, who is it or what is it or what mechanism could be used to counter that? Just like you have a first dealing with issues of security threats to the net where they band together to try and deal with them or you have a group like ICANN which is trying to deal with kind of global issues of resource allocation. What body, what organization, what entity, what mechanism could be used to deflect this attempt to redefine the internet to be something other than what it is? I would say that that's a truth in advertising issue and that every government has some mechanism for dealing with companies that advertise one thing and sell another. And it's a question then of whether that government is willing to enforce its laws. Um, so at that point there needs to be some kind of global consensus around what, what is truly internet service and what is a walled garden or what is uh, you know, something that has failed a network neutrality test. What, you guys? Well, uh, I don't know if there is a, a, a final guardian of the current in internet. Uh, there is uh, some organizations that are playing an important role right now trying to, to keep the stability, like ICANN, the IRRs, ISOC itself, that um, uh, their main concern is to keep the stability on the internet. That's, that's the main reason of existence, I think, of these organizations and all the efforts are put in that, in, for that objective. And I can tell you that it's a lot of cross uh, sharing information, a lot of coordination among these organizations. They are not working independently. There is a lot of, of coordination efforts among these organizations. Um, you can see right now in the village, uh, you can see the stands of the booth of ICANN, the NRO, which is the, the organization within um, half these five IRRs, uh, and ISOC, are, our neighbors, they are very well identified organizations that are working to uh, to keep the stability of the robustness of the internet. I think it is to trying to answer that uh, the questions. I think that will be the counterbalance in case of something can can be identified as threats. You know. I think we have time for one more question. Um, gentleman right here. <coughs> The 
policies regarding security threat, is there is any standard mechanism available for the monitoring of the lawful interception and monitoring systems? And one more question in addition to it, is there any, any uh, mechanism involved for the exchanging the sensitive information among the countries? Let me, let me just repeat the question for anyone who didn't hear it. Uh, first, is there a standards effort involved in lawful interception, that is, um, legal wiretapping by governments? And secondly, is there any coordination mechanism between governments uh, for sharing wiretap data from the Internet? Um, so the IETF had a working group on this, uh, mostly at the behest of the United States government uh, on how on, on standard protocols for requesting an interception on internet equipment and this was intensely controversial there were many people within the IETF who boycotted the discussion who would not entertain discussion of wiretap on the other hand there is more and more, particularly financial crime, occurring on the internet. And in the, say, five or six years since that discussion was had in the IETF, I think problems have gotten enough worse that pretty much everyone recognizes that we need law enforcement to be better equipped now, not more poorly equipped. Uh, there are some inherent complexities to doing wiretap on the internet because of the um, asymmetry of the paths that traffic takes. If you were to perform a wiretap, it needs to be directly adjacent to one of the participants in the conversation, not deep out in the center of the network, because if it's out in the center of the network, probably it will only see one direction of the two directions of the conversation. So. Inherently, this is a difficult problem. Uh, work has been done. Um, the major equipment vendors do have interfaces for law enforcement to request information out of the equipment. Um, the second part of the question, uh, do governments have mechanisms for exchanging this information? In theory, it all goes through Interpol. Uh, it, it's a very cumbersome mechanism and very slow relative to the fast pace of internet crime. Um, internet service providers have a much faster mechanism, but the, the level of triage in what cases are addressed is different between these. Um, law enforcement agencies may take cases up on different set of priorities, different criteria than internet service providers would. Internet service providers really don't care too much about small cases of individual fraud. What they're interested in is protecting their largest customers and protecting their own infrastructure. So any crimes that attack the largest customers or the internet infrastructure itself will be responded to quickly by the internet service provider community who have a very good international cooperation mechanism that doesn't run afoul of um, the, the legal protections that governments give their citizens from governmental intervention, right? Uh, an internet service provider doesn't have to worry about quite as many of the um, privacy protections, for instance, as a national government would. Do you guys have things on that? No. No? Okay. Um, that exhausts the time that this session is allocated. Uh, um, I think we'll all uh, remain here and be happy to continue conversations with any of you individually, but uh, we need to, I think, probably release the room soon to its next users. Uh, our email addresses are up here on the screen. Uh, we'll make these slides available through the IGF website. Um, you're welcome to track any of us down and ask any further questions you might have uh, either right now or um, throughout the rest of the week. And we hope that you have a, a good week. Thank you. Thank you.
So we will try to invent uh, how to manage this session. May I first of all ask you, as many people who are here, to be to, to move forward if they can, so that we can have more intimate, more interactive, uh, and then have a truly an interactive session. Uh, I'm sure those those people who are in the room have a certain degree of commitment to this particular topic. And I think that commitment is, uh, is necessary when you realize the fact that roughly 10% of the world population has some form of the disability, which calculated very simply will represent about 600 million people with disabilities all over the world. And that's a staggering number. These people, they have the same rights as anybody else. They deserve the same opportunities as anybody else. And we simply cannot leave them to their own, to fend for themselves. The society has the obligation to respect for their dignity, to give them life of opportunities and life that allows them to become productive part of the society. We know that about 80% of the people with disabilities live in isolated rural areas. 62 million children of primary school age go with disability. And the next figure that I'm going to mention to you, 186, 186 million children with disabilities have not completed primary school. And if we coming, I come from UNESCO, where of course our mission is education for all. If such large number of people with disabilities do not have are not able to complete even primary education, then it is a serious issue. Our mission of education for all cannot be fulfilled if we do not include these 186 million children. And as we speak, that number is growing. We also know that fewer than 2% of children with disabilities in developing countries are in school. Fewer than 2%. When you look at these figures, 600 million, 186 million children not able to complete primary school. Only 2% children with disabilities in developing countries are in school. These are really mind-boggling figures. They are just not figures, they are people. They are people, they are real people. And we just simply cannot afford the world, the, the community, the society cannot simply say, well, it's your problem, you fend for it. The, the UN standard rules on equalization of opportunities for persons with disabilities says that for persons with disabilities of any kind, it should, the state should introduce programs of action to make the physical environment accessible and undertake measures to provide access to information and communication technologies, which is the topic of discussion in this conference. As we all know that the World Summit on the Information Society talked a great deal about the issue of access to information and knowledge, the issue of infrastructure, the security, the capacity building, the, the question of linguistic and cultural diversity, the question of I, ICT, ethical dimensions of the information society, a whole range of issues. If you recall, some of you participated in the, in, in the preparatory processes as well as the two phases of the summit. The C2, which refers to infrastructure, talks about um, encourage the design and production of ICT equipment services so that everyone has easy and affordable access to them, including older people and persons with disabilities. 
Action line three, access to information and knowledge talks about adoption of ICT infrastructure tools and applications that facilitate accessibility of ICTs for all. And action line four, capacity building talks about ad addresses the need to ensure the benefits offered by ICT for all, including disadvantaged, marginalized, and vulnerable groups. So the, the world bodies, the, 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 the process that brings us here, the IGF, is the product of the World Summit on the Information Society. And here we are again after several years, the, the second phase of the the World Summit was held in Tunis in 2005. We are now almost uh, end of 2008. We're still discussing the issues. What have we really done? What needs to be done? We have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, three prominent panelists. Um, I just, I want to be very democratic. I'll ask them how they want to proceed because they know their stuff. Would you like to go first? Women first. You are, you want to be first? The the Chinese Depends. presentation is already up and ready. Okay, very good. So uh, I will invite Mr. Gao Zemin, who is the standing vice chairman of the Internet Society of China. He he holds several other titles, uh, but I'm sure you will discover all his talents and expertise in this area through his presentation. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very pleased to be here to make a presentation about the uh, web accessibility issues on behalf of the Internet Society of China. Uh, actually, I want to uh, explain personally my uh, myself is not an expert on this issue, but the Internet Society of China very active involved to promote web accessibility in China. Have done a lot and very successful. So I'm very pleased and proud to make presentation here to introduce situation to you. Uh, my, in my presentation, I want to start from uh, recall, recalling the background about this uh, issue, definitions. Uh, I think the, uh, you know the W3C, they make a lot. I just uh, met uh, a gentleman from Microsoft the US. Uh, he, uh, he told me 10 years ago, he involved in initiative for uh, draft the standard of the web accessibility issues. He is now present here. He's an expert, I think. So it's a better definition is still uh, should be recall what is the, uh, what is the uh, web accessibility and the importance of this issue. We recognize very important for China also. Then I will introduce you briefly about the uh, internet development recently in China and the present situation of the web accessibility in China. Then I will tell you uh, what we have done so far on this issue. The Internet Society of China already have taken a me several measures and actions incorporated with uh, several institutions under the uh, leadership of the Ministry of the Information uh, Technology. The, uh, in our group, we also have uh, experts on this uh, 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 field. I, uh, afterward, after my presentation, if you have some questions, I ask them to answer you in more detailed manner. Then afterward, I will give you some uh, cases, uh, examples, uh, it's uh, disabled people, they all already get some help uh, directly or indirectly from us. So I will give you a, a lot of examples, but uh, because the time is very limited, I just give you a few 
uh, very impressive uh, examples. That's so, all. First of all, the background. Uh, you know the World Summit on the Information Society uh, has appealed that the issues concern the person with disab disability and other dis dis disadvantaged group should be considered. This is announced in principle of the summit, uh, of the uh, uh, WSIS uh, uh, announcement. And uh, other international organization, ESCAP, United Nations organization, also in May of the 2002, adopt resolution. Uh, the end of the call for promoting a inclusive, very free, and right-based society for people with disability in the Asia, Asian and the Pacific region in the 21st century. This resolution also extending in uh, used to be from 1993, 2002, the first decade for dis uh, disab disabled persons, extending this decade to another decade, 2003 to 2012. That increases the importance and the prior priority in this area, web accessibility. So in China, we were, in China, I see in particular in recent five years, we are very uh, emphasis this importance. Then we, re we recognize the information accessibility means the people with disability can use the web-based internet. And the web accessibility means that people with disability can perceive can preserve the contents on the web, uh, perceive whether there is a photograph, a multi multimedia, not only text, uh, all the contents in all the uh, types, they, they can be perceived. Understand what the contents mean. They should, should be understandable, navigate and uh, interact. Then they can not only beneficial from web contents, but also they can contribute to web, the internet development for other disability people. So uh, information accessibility issue, I think it not only for uh, uh, for re resolving this problem, but also they have considering advantage of the ICT technology to create condition and promote the equal opportunities and the equal access of the inform information, not only web, other information, uh, traditional uh, printing, uh, 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 radio, television, it is traditional media. Also, they can access other traditional media. Yeah. So I think it's a meaning definition of the information accessibility. So it's uh, uh, very important to understand that, what the meaning. Why the information accessibility uh, issue is so important. I think it's three points. First one, we all recognize the internet now is increasingly important resources in many aspects of life, including the people of disab disability. Education, employment, uh, receive public service from government to do business, uh, uh, recreation, everything. So it's very essential. Internet should be 
accessible not only for normal person, people, but also particularly important for disability people in order to provide them equal access and equal opportunities. And they have more opportunity to involve and to participate the social lives is is one of the reason. The second one I just mentioned, internet is used ICT technology. Not only can provide web contents to be accessed to be useful, but also they can use the technology to improve the traditional. Uh, media contents to be access, uh, accessible, to be useful for them. So it's also important. Third one reason, the current day, current day, this situation, particularly in China, I don't know other country, maybe it's the same, same situation. Web software and the website contents, the accessibility barrier still very serious make their make disabled people very difficult even impossible to use access the contents on the web so what is importance this problem then china in general internet development very rapidly very successful uh, officially China interact with the internet just started from 1994. In this year, in video this year, according to statistics, the internet user, numbers of internet users in China already reached 258 million people. Of course, among those, maybe disabled person is very few. As a normal person, it's our association visions. Just as Chairman Dr. Ken mentioned, global disabled person, disabled people, the number is very huge. Yeah. And China also, according to the statistic, number of disabled people in China, uh, almost 83 million. Uh, it's a very huge, huge number. Uh, among those, they have uh, visual disability, uh, consists of uh, 15, uh, 15 percent. Uh, 12 million who have a uh, hearing disability 20 million speech 1.3 million physical disability uh, 24 million and so on so you can see those people they are very urgent uh, to get the web contents in their daily life, uh, in their life. This is a very urgent problem. But also according to uh, statistics, almost 95%, even 99% of the internet resources, web contents, are uh, not be able to obtain by seriously disabled peoples. Uh, serious old people, very difficult, uh, very difficult. So in terms uh, of the web accessibility, China, in China, we started late. We started late uh, because uh, a lot of uh, reasons started late. But now the internet already popularized uh, very grows very growing very fast. We have to increase this 
web accessibility this ISO should be uh, should be contacted and uh, should be uh, taking some measure to improve. So on this background, the Internet Society of China acts as a bridge between governments and uh, companies, related partners, to committing to promote web accessibility to establish internet be beneficial for everyone, including disabled person. What do we have done so far? Mainly three measures we have done. First one, since 2003, we started organize information accessibility forum every year. Uh, our chairman, Dr. Han, uh, I think uh, before year or before last year, you attended yeah. our forum. Yes. Yeah, you can make comments. What, how do you, <laughs> our whole forum proceed? Very helpful, very helpful. On the, stay, on the uh, beginning, this forum are focused to raise awareness of this importance. Awareness. Awareness. Then, afterwards, particularly last year, we already shift the focus of the forum, not only make some propaganda, some speech, some picture, some video, not only that. Involve to draft and the issue web accessibility standard. Uh, standard. And uh, encourage some private sector to develop software, web software, products, some technical assistant tools. Yeah. During the forum last year, I saw a lot of products. We have a small exhibition. Very impressive. Very useful for disabled person. Second measure I just just mentioned, we draft and uh, already published information accessibility standard. Yeah, this standard, the core named information accessibility for people with physical disability, technical requirements for web accessibility. The basic four principles of all this standard, perceivable, perceivable, operable, understandable, and uh, compatible. Uh, the, uh, I think the perceivable I just mentioned, you should make web contents in form of the picture, uh, video, uh, multimedia should be, they have a test equivalent, equivalent to be perceived by, uh, by some uh, disabled people. They have a visual disability. Yeah. So we already have a very uh, standard, it's a very sophisticated standard. Also, it's a standard uh, comparable with the uh, uh, W3C standard. Uh, comparable, but uh, they make some uh, 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 adjustment. Uh, I, I think if you have question, I ask uh, our expert present here, uh, Mrs. Wu and Mrs. Uh, uh, Wu, uh, they, 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 they answer your question uh, afterward. Then, uh, third one we have uh, uh, in this year uh, actually started from last year for preparing uh, 2008 Olympic and uh, Paralympic game 
in Beijing. We get support from Ministry of the Information Technology to cooperate with uh, China Communication Standards Association and uh, China Academy of uh, Telecom under the MI. We organize and sponsor major website in China portal and the government, government portal and the private portal major to over, organize them, sponsor, support them to transform their web page uh, according to our standard to be perceived, understandable, and uh, 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 navigate, navigable and uh, uh, in interact with uh, disability. I think this measure is uh, first ex first time. Of course, this this work is very long, very long uh, work we shall do. Okay, okay, thank you. Some, some of the, uh, in, during the uh, uh, Olympic Games, some, uh, 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 foreign, some foreign disabled uh, 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 sportsmen, they, they came to, to Beijing and uh, they, were get, they got a very, very good feeling. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a internet in China. We can access, we can understand more. Uh, very impressive. Yeah. Then I think uh, a lot of uh, as judges, uh, a lot of uh, pers the pers disabled pers person already get some beneficial from our help, uh, directly, indirectly. Uh, some people they open their uh, shop online, uh, sell their products, and get some profit. They can survive by themselves. Yeah. They also they uh, open their BBS. Or, or a chat room to discuss with their friends, also disabled person. They make some uh, social group, uh, exchange their experience, how to improve their health, physical, physical disability improved, and how to uh, uh, improve their life, quality of life. Uh, because the time already limited, I finish uh, my presentation here. So, conclusion, this issue, very important, particularly in China. Uh, we will continue our efforts to promote, improve uh, web accessibility in China. Uh, and also, we have, we very pleased and uh, want to exchange ex experience and skill and expertise with uh, other country uh, uh, present here. Thank you very much for your attention. China, uh, I'm one of the hats I wear is I'm vice chair of the Internet Society Disability and Special Needs Chapter. My name is Cynthia Waddell and I'm the executive director of the International Center for Disability Resources on the Internet. I also serve as the accessible ICT for government services expert for the United Nations Global Initiative for Inclusive ICTs. I am a person with a hearing uh, disability and very much appreciate the captioning that's being provided today, not only for participants here in the display on the right hand corner, on my right hand, but also for the remote <coughs> access hubs that are uh, listening in today. So my presentation is very brief. I'm going to have a discussion on the accessible web, the paradigm shift. We will be addressing five topics, technology crossroad, the shift in the disability definition, signs of what I call the global inclusive society shift, 
accessible web design, and some resources. So let's begin. Today we are at a technology crossroad where our technology choices will determine whether or not everyone will be able to participate in the new society. The explosive growth of electronic commerce has contributed to ongoing demand for user interface requirements. The shift from web content publishing to interactive web applications, enterprise portals, and networks requires ICT design, that is information and communication technology, to provide the greatest flexibility for user participation. We're beginning to see an ICT evolution to a multi-modality architecture where the interactive technology provides support for visual, auditory, and tactile access. And we are beginning to see the evidence of a global human rights alignment, addressing the right to accessible communication and the accessible design of technologies and the web, such as the UN uh, Convention or Treaty on Rights to Persons with Disabilities, and many national legislation efforts that are underway across the globe. We are also seeing a shift in the definition of disability in the world view. I would like you to consider the definition found in the convention preamble as we discuss this paradigm shift. Looking at the convention preamble, we learn that disability is an evolving concept that results from the interaction between persons with impairment and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. The definition of disability is also shifting in that in Article 1 of the Convention, it states that persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairment, which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. From a public policy point of view, the good news is that I believe we are beginning to see the signs of an inclusive society shift. First, there's a global society shift away from viewing a person with a disability from the medical model perspective of diagnosis and inability to a focus now on ability, integration, and the problem of incompatibility between people and the environment. We're also seeing the emergence of the civil rights model and its merger with the social rights model. In other words, there is a growing understanding that disability results from an interaction between non-inclusive society and individuals. A person using a wheelchair might have difficulties gaining employment, not because of the wheelchair, but because of environmental barriers such as inaccessible buses or staircases that impede access. Or a person who is blind might not have access to a screen reader at the work site so that she could be employed. Signs of an inclusive society shift are found in the growing recognition of significant social costs if the digital divide or web barriers remain. For example, in his August 2005 report on the World Program of Action, the UN Secretary General said, quote, unless persons with disabilities are brought into the development mainstream, it will be impossible to cut poverty by half by the year 2015, as agreed by heads of state and government at the UN Millennium Summit in September 2000. We are also seeing a growing recognition that accessible web design promotes equal opportunity for persons with disabilities. For example, as government services move online and are available 24-7, it becomes more obvious to persons with disabilities when they cannot participate, especially when the websites are not designed to be accessible. And so accessible web ensures that everyone can access services and in many cases, government can be more efficient. The emergence of technical standards for accessible design of information and communication technologies has been a significant development. We are seeing both national standards and industry standards. For example, in the US, it began in 1995 when I wrote the first accessible web design standard for local government. 
It was written in, in response to an Americans with Disabilities Act complaint by a blind city commissioner. The standard was immediately recognized as the best practice by the U.S. federal government. And little did I realize that a local solution to our problem of accessible e-government would become a national and global solution. Our effort and many others across the country in the U.S. contributed to the eventual passage by Congress in 1998 of legislation that strengthened Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act and directed U.S. Access Board rulemaking for electronic and information technology accessibility standards, applicable to only the, not only to the web, but also for mainstream technology. These technical rules define the accessibility requirements for ICT. For the first time in U.S. history, the federal government, government now must procure accessible technology. Now businesses have a marketplace incentive to design accessibly and can challenge federal government contract awards to a vendor whose product was not as successful as others. In the industry, we see the World Wide Web Consortium launching the Web Accessibility Initiative and in 1999 produced the W3C uh, WCAG uh, Web Content Accessibility Guideline 1.0. Another significant indicator of the shift of uh, inclusive society uh, is that in, 19, in 2006, I conducted a global survey uh, to find out what was going on. And, and as, at that time, at least 26 countries and jurisdictions around the world had adopted accessible web uh, design as a policy or a law. Technical standards that I saw across the globe at that time uh, included implementing the U.S. Section 508 rules, accessible web rules, the World Wide Web Consortium, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 1.0, and other variations. And this is documented in my, uh, the first book I wrote, uh, Web Accessibility, Web Standards, and Regulatory Compliance. But perhaps the most significant activity concerning the global inclusive society shift is the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 